Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school. And that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. All right, all right. Welcome, everybody, to the show today. I have uh, a really incredible guest uh, today. Incredible because this is someone who I have been reading, paying attention to, um, consider a muse and mentor of mine in terms of someone who has really directed my life through his work, although this is the first time he and I are meeting. And this is the artist, uh, Stephen Pressfield, artist, writer. You may know him, Legends of Bagger Vance. Uh, the Gates of Fire. He is someone who has written in both genres, uh, nonfiction and fiction, and been incredibly successful at doing that. You probably know his work, and we're going to have a conversation today about his newest book, which is this one right here, Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be. I've already read it once, and I'm on my second read. This is one of these books that is incredibly a uh, powerful. It's almost as if Stephen, you took like just the bare bones wisdom of your life, put it into a book, and made it like every single page is loaded with wisdom. And sometimes I have to stop with these very short chapters and play it again or huh. look at it again. But I just want to say thank you so much for being here on the Next Level Human Podcast. Thank you so much for your work. And why don't we start with you telling a little bit about your story of how you got here, and then let's get into into the book. Well, first, thanks for having me, Jade. It's it's a real pleasure after you know sort of years of knowing each other via, via Instagram and other places like that. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm not exactly sure what you want me to say, but uh, I'm. You mean just sort of a background of where I'm coming from? That sort of thing? yeah. You know what I think would be interested for interesting for all of us, Stephen, is this idea of like you know most people they see you and they see your body of work and they go you know this must have always been easy for him. This you know he's huh. already made it, and I know a little bit about your story, and I know that that's far from the case. That you went through a lot of the same struggles that a lot of us went through. So why don't we go back to the beginning before you were a successful writer when you were just hoping and dreaming to be and walk us a little bit through what was going on and how you made this sort of hero's journey to get where you are today. Well, I sort of, um, I first quit a job. I had a job in advertising in New York City and I quit when I was, I think, 24 to try to write a book. And I finally got a book published when I was 55. So that might give you a little bit of a... So along the way, I went through a a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, failure and um, wrote my... uh, I had an old boss who used to describe me as the man who has written more words for less money than anybody (laughs) in the history of the world. So it was definitely a long, long slog for me. Um, before I, I did finally sort of, my feet finally touched solid ground. Um, you know, in a lot of traveling, a lot of different jobs, that kind of thing. Yeah. So this is an, this is an interesting thing. So in your twenties, you're writing and you're, you know, and then you finally get published in your fifties. And from my perspective, most people, Stephen would have just quit. They just would have said, you know what? It's not for me. Uh, this is not my world. I'm just going to give up. No one wants to listen to what I have to say. Um, How did you, because, you know, I have this thing that where sometimes we believe 
so strongly in what we're doing, but the world has also given us feedback. And you know what it reminds me of? Like American Idol, when these people get up on stage and yeah, some of them yeah. sing and they swear they can sing, but then we go, oh my God, whoever told them they can sing? And so when you're an artist writing and doing this work and you know you're good, but the world isn't giving you feedback, it's hard, I would imagine, to not sometimes go, maybe I'm just no good at this. Like, why isn't why doesn't anyone want to buy my work? Why isn't anyone paying attention? And I am so interested in how you kept going during these times where the world was seemingly telling you, Stephen, we don't want to. No one wants to read your work. No one wants to pay attention. You must have had something going on in your head that made you just go, I believe in what I'm doing and I'm going to keep after it. Well, you know, I really was no good, Jake. You know, that's the thing about, at least about writing, it might be different in fitness because there's kind of an age factor a little mm. bit. But the thing about writing is that you can get better, mm. you know, I, for years, I mean, every now and then, like the first three novels that I wrote, I couldn't sell. Mm. And every now and then, I would take them out of the drawer today, right, and ask myself, you know, is there any way to – and I look at them, I go, nope, they belong in the drawer, and they better stay there. But uh, the other thing for me was that many – I mean, what you were just uh, – the monologue that you were just saying that maybe the world is, you're just not good enough. You know what you're bringing to the table. Nobody wants. I mean, that was a, a loop just playing in my head, you know, for 30 years, nonstop. Um, and there were times when I tried to go straight a lot of times, you know, when I tried to get like a real job and really settle down like a normal adult human being, but I could never do it. I mean, at the end of the day, I would be so depressed that if I didn't, you know, just sort of keep trying to write, even though nobody wanted what mm -hmm. I, I would just I just couldn't couldn't stand it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of really had no plan B or no working plan B. You know, everything every time I would try to do that, it was just so depressing that I just, you know, couldn't do it. So I just had no choice to sort of keep going. And the other thing is that little by little along the way, it wasn't all just failure, failure, failure. Like before I um, actually had a, a novel published, I had a career as a screenwriter for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that at least I never did anything good, never made a lot of money or anything like that. But at least I was working in my field, right? I was learning what a story was and I was getting paid. Mm -hmm. So there was elements of success there, even though it wasn't the real success that I wanted. So that kept me going mm. for that for that period of time. There was hope. I was learning. I was getting better. Yeah. So it sounds like if I'm hearing you right, it's this idea that, you know, okay, Jade, one, self-awareness. Like, it's really interesting for people like us to go, okay, here's Stephen Pressfield, who just was like, Jade, I wasn't any good at the time. So there's that going on. You're getting better. But there's the other part of you going, OK, I have this loop in my head that maybe people don't want to read my work, yet I feel so deeply in my heart that this is what I'm meant to do. And if I'm not doing it, I'm not happy. And so it sounds like you were like looking for anything possible where you could be engaged in this work. So you get hooked up being a screenwriter. Maybe you weren't the chief screenwriter. Maybe you were in the group with, uh, you know, five or six people and you were maybe the last on the list, but you were learning and you were. Uh, honing your craft and you were staying in the zone of what you loved. And this speaks a little bit to obviously the book. The theme of this book is right. It's like this idea that if I want to do something and feeling in my heart, then I need to put my proverbial ass in that place. My physical body needs to be in that place. And it seems like this is exactly what you were doing when you were young. OK, maybe you weren't going to sell the novel right then, but you were going to be in the room. Yes. And what I when I say put your ass where your heart wants to be, there's a lot of different levels of that. Mm -hmm. But the, the primary one, when I say ass, is what I really mean is commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, put your, you know, your risk, mm -hmm. you know. It's a risk. Anytime you put your commitment someplace, right? You commit to a, to a, if you're a trainer and you're committing to some kind of program that you want to expand your life in, that you can fall on your ass on that, right? You can lose, you know? So, but once the point of putting your ass where your heart wants to be is that a certain magic happens 
when you put your physical body in the place that you want to be and when you put your your aspirational body, your metaphysical body, your commitment in a place. I, I really believe that the universe lines up with you, that you change your DNA changes when you truly commit, when you're not sort of half-assed about it, one foot in, one foot out. And uh, so I'll give myself credit for that. My ass was in it all the time. It just took a long, long time. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that uh, just for whatever this is worth to our listeners, uh, the work that I was doing when I finally did start to get published was qualitatively different and qualitatively better than it was earlier than that. But not just not just better in the sense that uh, it was at a higher level of skill. It was coming from a different place. It was coming from a more authentic place for me. I had I had really sort of at the point that I actually started to sell stuff. I was I was really writing from my heart. Mm. You know, I was not writing to try to do something that people would like or that I thought was cool. I was really coming from a different place. So it was a sort of a there was a kind of a breakthrough there mm. at some point. And uh, after that, things were a lot easier. Yeah. That what you just said is a fascinating area for us as humans, because I think when I think about psychology, I think that we have two, two or three sides of us. One side is this base level side of psychology, which is it's sort of just like the world is all about me, me, me. And I just want to <laughs> exert power and control. The next level up is sort of the culture level where it's like I'm going to do and produce work that the culture likes. And then the next level human side of things, from my perspective, is this idea that I'm simply going to do the work because I feel called to the work and I'm going to do what's you know in my heart. And let's see what shows up. And it sounds like you made that tr transition somewhere along the line. And I'm wondering if you can remember when, like, when did you make that that was it a choice? Did it just sort of show up that way? Or was there a time and a moment where you were just like, uh -huh. you know what, I'm fed up. I am just going to start writing what's in my heart and whatever happens with it happens with it. Was there a time that you can remember that that actually was your uh -huh. state of mind? That's a great question, Jade. And I also like your three part uh, thing mm -hmm. there. I, I've never thought of it that way. And I agree with that. Um, but th there was a time like uh, um, the first book that I wrote that actually I felt was from my heart was The Legend of Bagger Vance mm. that, you know, became a movie. It was a lousy movie, but it's a good book. Mm. If anybody has, hasn't read it, it's a good book. Anyway, I the way that happened was I was at the end of maybe a 10-year screenwriting career. And in that career, I've probably written maybe 35 screenplays, mm. something like that. And uh, of all genres, of westerns, detective stories, science fiction, and I, that was sort of like what you just said, as trying to sort of find what the market wanted, mm -hmm. or what the, what you know, what I could I fill a demand that was out there. And then what happened with Bagger Vance was the idea just kind of came to me. It really is sort of mystical in a way. It kind of came to me out of nowhere as a book, not as a movie. And I remember at the time I had a meeting with my agent and told him that I was going to write this book. And the short version is he basically fired me. Mm. He basically said, and he was right. He said, I've been busting my ass for you for five years, Steve. Now we've got a career going and you're going to believe it. Mm. But I had no choice. I was just kind of seized by this. And when I kind of look back on that book and the way it was structured, it just it just came out of my ass, if you'll forgive me for, for putting it. it. It's like now, if I would, as a more experienced writer, if I went back in that book and tried to, to structure it like I did, I would not have done it that way. But it just kind of came out of me. So I would have to say some other force was at work there. Mm. I really didn't make the decision. I really didn't say, oh, I'm just going to write from my heart. You know, it just kind of came out of me and I just didn't stop it. Mm. That was my contribution was just not to stop it. Yeah. Um, and after that, I really feel like everything I've done after that has been from my heart one way or another. They all feel like children of mine and I'm proud of all of them. Yeah. It, it's almost as if like when you're talking about it, it's almost as if you, it was something being channeled through you that needed to be birthed 
that only you could do. You know, that that book, by the way, I love that book because while it's while it's about golf on the surface, it's a very philosophical, very deep book. Um, that's why I think everyone needs to read Legend of Bagger Vance because I think they think golf when they <laughs> when they think yeah, of that yeah. book. But that book is a very deep philosophical book. And I did too, Jay. I th- when I was working on that, I thought to myself, this is the dumbest idea I've ever had. This is completely non-commercial. Nobody's going to read this book. Even I wouldn't read a book. If I were describing this book to people, I would, you know, they would just say, what are you, crazy? This is just totally stupid. But I couldn't stop myself. I was just seized by it. I just had to do it. And to my amazement, really, when it when I started submitting it, it sold in like two minutes, and which is utterly unheard of, and became a movie in another two minutes after that. So... There's something to the to the uh, idea that when you finally do sort of hit the bullseye, a lot of times to you, to the individual, it seems completely wrong. It's like, why am I doing this? It's a crazy idea. Nobody's going to like this except me. Nobody's going to be interested in it except me. It doesn't, in my experience, you don't think of it like, oh, this is a slam dunk. I've really... I'm really on target with this one. It seems to be the opposite. And, and it's happened with other books too, mm-hmm. where I've thought like Gates of Fire, my second book. I also thought this is another crazy idea that nobody's going to be interested in but me. But again, I was sort of seized by it. So sometimes I think the ideas that we have that really are breakthrough ideas seem crazy even to us. You know, there's a lot of self-doubt there, a lot of questioning of, you know, why do I love this so much? But again, it, there is a, a certain element of another dimension coming in there, a, a greater wisdom coming in there. The muse knows that what we're doing is right, even if we don't believe it at the moment. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, when you use the term muse, and I want to cover this, I want to just uh, talk to you about this because I think it's fascinating because whenever I hear you talk about the muse, uh, you don't seem to talk about the muse like a lot of people do, like that it's just sort of this not real thing that's kind of out there that sort of influences you. You seem to talk about it like, no, there is an actual real force, perhaps even a real spirit that is, you know, essentially working through you. And I find this absolutely uh, phenomenal, especially when you think about the trajectory that you sort of come through. So here's a guy who's, you know, got his ass in the chair, doing the work in the screenplay 30 years. And all of a sudden he comes up with this crazy idea that even logically to him seems like, I don't know that anyone's going to buy this. He, he goes to his agent. His agent goes, you're crazy. And then he does it anyway out of sure, sheer feeling. And then it turns into this amazing thing to your surprise. And then I just go, obviously, having that felt experience tells you that there's something deeper going on here. And I want to know when you first were like, oh, my gosh, something deeper is going on. And I think it might be this sort of magical realm. Like, when did that first come to you? Because obviously it wouldn't have come to you without this deep felt experience. Uh, It's another great question, Jade. And like year, I'll give you the long answer to this. Years earlier, probably 20 years earlier, I had a mentor, a friend, an older writer. He's maybe like 30 years older than me, a guy named Paul Rink. And at one point, he gave me, typed out for me, and handed me the prayer, to the invocation of the muse from Homer's Odyssey, mm. which is like the first 12 lines of the Odyssey. And it's Homer saying, praying to the goddess and saying, you know, help me tell this story. So I, I sort of imbibed that idea from him at that time, but I didn't really kind of believe it. You know, it, it seemed like it was a nice kind of airy fairy thing. But by the time, you know, another 20 years had passed, I really, I was ready to believe it. And when, and from Bagger Vance on, I believe it completely. I absolutely believe that we, life exists on two levels, at least two. The lower level is the material plane where we are, where our ass is in the form of put your ass where your heart wants to be. And the upper level is a dimension above us. You could call it heaven. You could call it, uh, if you were in the Native American tradition, you would call it where the ancestors are. You know, um, if you were with the ancient Greeks, it would be where the goddesses and gods live on Mount Olympus. But I believe there's another level higher. When I say put your ass where your heart wants to be, I mean, put your ass, your lower level self, 
up here where your heart wants mm -hmm. to be. Live in that level. Trust that level. Open the channel between those things. And so I, if someone would ask me, I've said this before, what my, um, what my occupation is, I wouldn't say I'm a writer. I would say I'm a servant of the muse. And what I mean by that is I absolutely believe in this higher level. And I think that all ideas, songs, movies, books, new businesses, entrepreneurial ventures, all those ideas come from that higher level. It's like the classic thing that we we uh, live in our in our regular life is maybe we're driving along the freeway and something pops into our head, right? Or we're in the shower or we're sort of half asleep. We're in some sort of a twilight state where our ego is not in the way. And all of a sudden something comes into us, an idea for a book, an idea for a song, a poem, whatever. And I really live my life sort of trying to tune in to that cosmic radio station. And when I get, you know, the music starts flowing, it's my job to get it down on paper. That's what, that's how I see it. Yeah. So, um, I love I love that that's, answer, and, and that's my story, and I'm sticking yeah, to it. Yeah, and you know, it reminds me of a of a sort of way I like to think about this when in when I'm in my creative space. It's almost as if you know, there's this universal consciousness that I would describe like a river, right? And we're essentially in a canoe on this river, being pulled in a a certain direction. And a lot of people, if you're not aware of this and and look, looking for the signs, you'll you'll tend to want to maybe go upstream or try to go sideways or run into a rock and get yourself in trouble because you're not following this flow. But I think true genius really is um, just laying back in the canoe, using your hands as rudders, draping them into the water <laughs> and allowing the canoe to pull you where you're a co-creator. So you're essentially in flow with this universal sort of directive. And it seems like um, what you're telling us to pay attention to is that there's a degree of faith and trust that this is a real process and that you have learned to trust it. And when you started, and, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like once you started truly trusting this process from this other domain that you were able to tap into and started putting your attention on what it wants to, you know, essentially uh, bring out through you, all of a sudden, things started to change, which is kind of interesting if that's actually true, because it's like on the one hand, your culture level self is like, let me figure out what people want. Let me create it. Let me be good at what people want. And then your next level self sort of goes, OK, I'm just going to do what I feel. And in a roundabout way, you end up getting the cultural success <laughs> that you sought doing the other thing. And so it's this very weird thing where it's like when I follow my heart, you know, and I do things that way, I end up getting the cultural success. But when I try to just get the cultural success and don't follow my heart, I seem to keep running into roadblocks. And I wonder if that's how you see it. That That's exactly how I see it. And it's sort of totally counterintuitive, totally something that you wouldn't you wouldn't believe that that's the way it works. But at least in my experience, that is the way it works. When I come up with an idea that I think, oh, this is a surefire slam dunk, fastball right over the middle commercial idea, I'm always wrong. Mm. It gets out there and it just bombs. But when I come up with something that kind of is coming from my some other place, uh, then that's the one that, that, that work. And the other thing I would say, Jade, is that the ideas that as they come always surprise me. It's... You know, from one book to the next, uh, I never know what's what's coming. I can't sort of plan things out in five-year increments or anything like that. It's like the, this other wisdom knows what it wants, and it's my job to just kind of, you know, go along with that. And I actually have a – I go with along with that river metaphor that you use, but I see it a little differently. I see it like – an underground river that's flowing inside us. Mm. And our job is, is, is to trust it. Number one, you know, to believe that it's in there. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. I want to recommend a book to everybody that's watching this. Um, it's called the creative act and it's by Rick Rubin, R U B I N. If you guys haven't heard of him, he's was, is sort of the, uh, the godfather of hip hop. He's the, like the producer. You may have seen him. He's had a couple of shows on TV, a couple of reality shows about his studio, Shangri-La Studios in Southern California. And he wrote this book 
like what his his role is he'll bring a band a hip-hop band or a group or whatever you call it into his studios and he'll be sort of the facilitator he'll He's barefoot all the time. He's got a beard. He's like this hippie guy from, you know, the counterculture days. And he'll just sort of be this uh, almost like uh, the goddess, the muse for them. He'll kind of give them these crazy assignments, like write me a song in five minutes and don't change a word of it and try to shake them up. Anyway, the book is called The Creative Act, and it's brand new. I think you have to actually pre-order it. By Rick Rubin, I highly recommend it. I'm on it. I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely going to get that book because for me, I'm fascinated by this creative process. And many people who listen to this podcast, as you and I were talking before we came on live, you know, many people here are trying to um, change their lives. And there's something that I want to uh, ask you about that's kind of fascinated about me about the way you come at this because when most people think about I'm going to change my life and I want to do something different. They tend to, in my mind, subscribe to more of what we might call the secret, right? This idea that if I think a, a particular way and I start thinking positive thoughts or I get my thought process in alignment with this other thing that I want to do, then I'm going to have what I want. What's interesting about your process, it seems to me where it's like, you know what? It's not about thinking necessarily. It's about I am just going to want you to put yourself in the place where that person is. If you want to be a hip hop artist, you go to the studio. If you want to be a writer, you sit down in front of your your computer and you begin to write. If you want to be a dancer, you go out and you get in the studio. I've heard you sort of talk about this, which is a little bit different, but it makes some sense in terms of if you're actually doing the thing, you must then be thinking and feeling the thing. It's much easier to think and feel in alignment with doing than it is to be just thinking if you're not doing. And so I wonder if this is how and why you say this, because it's a very different self-development practice than I think most people talk about. You're just like, sit down, do what you're supposed to do. And, and it almost seems like you believe the thoughts and feelings will come out of that versus like sit there and think about it and hope that you start to do it. Is this how you see it? And, and is this the process you've used? Because it is a little bit different than the tr traditional self-development gurus talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, that's exactly right, Jade. I couldn't agree more with what you said. Um, I mean, I don't want to knock anything because I know that book, The Secret and the Law of Attraction, and supposedly it works for people. Uh, I don't believe in it at all. I mean, maybe it works for somebody else. I don't believe in it at all. I don't think the universe works that way. And I, I think action, putting your ass where your heart wants to be, it's like priming a pump or starting the motor. Mm. It gets something going. The universe responds to action. Like even if you were moving from one career to another, even if you just move one step along that way, you know, things will start to happen. Right? You, I don't think you need to actually make that giant leap in all one. You can, mm. but I think if you uh, like, if you were going to do a podcast, uh, you don't have to leap immediately to like Rich Roll where you have a great, beautiful studio. That, and even he didn't do that, mm. right? What, he just did one. Let me do one podcast with my friend Harry that I think is an interesting guy, you mm. know? And then let me do another one. And what happens is once you do one, this higher level of the universe, whether you call it the gods, the muses, the energy, whatever it is, they see it. The universe sees it and responds to it, you know, and uh, if let's say it's, uh, the podcast analogy, you start with your friend, Harry, you do one podcast and then somebody comes up to you, a guy from the gym or a girl from the gym and says to you, you know, my buddy Jack is a really fascinating guy. Why don't you have him on the podcast? So I'll introduce you right now. Right. And that's the universe responding. Mm. And the next thing you know, You've, you've done maybe a dozen of them and you're starting to get somewhere. And then you think, well, shit, maybe I get, ought to have a studio. Yeah. I better actually get a microphone. Yeah. Maybe I'll get a, a decent camera. And little by little, the, the action comes first. And then the, then the universe starts to help you out. Steven, I love this. And I'm wondering if you can help us through your experience because, okay, so let's say I make this leap, right? And I'm, I start to take the action and 
then it sounds like what you're saying, and I've had this experience as well, and I want to see how it shows up for you. Sounds like what you're saying is that certain serendipities will begin to occur. Certain things uh, will begin to happen that we may just take as coincidences. But it sounds like what you're saying, if I'm reading you correctly, is that this is not coincidences. This is the, the universe, the muse seeing you take action and going, OK, Jade's serious. Steven is serious. And I am now going to give them more of the creative potential that they've asked for and see what they do with it. See if I see if they really are serious. So I'll give them another guest and see if they jump on it. I'll give them another opportunity. See if they jump on it, see how serious they are. And then it begins to build. And I'm curious if this is how you see it. What were some of the most amazing serendipities or coincidences that you were just like, this can't just be by accident. Do you remember a few that you were just like, how is this even possible? Because it must seem like magic at times. Well, I, I certainly believe that completely. And but let me just take like a the most commonplace thing. We'll even forget the airy fairy part of it for a thing. Yeah. Let's say that you're um, you're a contractor. You're building houses, right? You are the boss and a kid comes to work for you and uh, you hire him kind of on on an impulse. He has has no credentials or whatever. And as you watch over week one, week two, week three, week four, you find that the kid is showing up there half hour before everybody else. He's sweeping up. He's doing the good, good work. When the day is over, he's working an, an extra half hour before he leaves. He doesn't he doesn't complain about money. He's always trying to learn something. You, the boss, meaning you, the universe, you're going to be inspired to take that kid aside and say, you know what? Let me give you a little more responsibility. How would you like to drive the truck that goes and gets the lumber every morning? Right. And I'm going to give you a raise and you'll do that. Right. So. That, in a way, is the universe responding. But if we look at it from our own point of view, if we're the boss, it's almost like we can't help ourselves. We see somebody and his ass is where his heart wants to be. This is a kid that's that wants to do it. Right. And so we can't help but kind of guide them along. And I think that's that's not really airy fairy, but it's it's the reality kind of of way the the way the universe works. So, again, what made that kid what prompted us to help that kid was his actions. He showed us, you know, and I believe that the gods look down and they see that same thing. You know, you've done a podcast and another one and another one and another one. Okay, I'm going to give him another guest. And and I, I believe that's how the universe works. Let me interrupt the show just for a few minutes because I want to tell you about one of our sponsors, Evolve telemed one of the questions i get all of the time one of the services that you are asking me for constantly is hormone replacement therapy women going through menopause women going through perimenopause women in postmenopause women under stressful situations who are dealing with low sex hormone levels estrogen and progesterone are constantly asking me about progesterone therapy or estrogen and progesterone therapy and men same thing, constantly asking me about testosterone replacement therapy. Plenty of you, many of you, always asking, Jade, can you prescribe me hormones? I need testosterone if you're a man, or I need estrogen and progesterone, or testosterone if you're a woman. And I always have to say that I am no longer seeing patients in this way because my educational duties are keeping me so busy. And this is where Evolve Telemed comes in. I have been looking for a company that does bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, and that is critically important. If you're going to be doing HRT or TRT, HRT being hormone replacement therapy for women, TRT being testosterone replacement therapy for men, if you are going to do these therapies, you want the bioidentical hormones. You want the hormones that your body makes naturally, that your body can recognize, that is no different from the hormones your body would make if you were making adequate levels. Bioidentical hormone replacement therapy does just this. And Evolve Telemed is a company that I am now using for my own testosterone replacement needs and have been super impressed with the way that they have structured their business model. And so I am now bringing this service to you through my partnership with Evolve Telemed. Essentially, the way this works is you go online, you make an appointment with Evolve, Evolve gets a doctor 
with you on a Zoom call. They go through your whole case. They go through your blood labs. They then prescribe your hormones directly to you and you can get those hormones wherever you are. You do not have to go to a clinic near you. All you need is to have an internet access point and you can meet with an expert in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and get those prescriptions. Now you can see why this is so powerful, can't you? Because this is something that so many of us need and can benefit from for our aging needs, our sexual health needs. These things have profound impact on mood, hair, skin, erections, libido, you name it. These things do everything for our metabolic health and vitality. So I am incredibly excited to bring Evolve Telemed to you. Now, the link that you go to is drjade.com slash hormones. drjade.com slash hormones. This will bring you to the Evolve Telemed portal. If you use the code next level, you will get a discount on checkout for your first patient visit. I'm very excited to be able to bring this to you and I hope you will use Evolve Telemed. I know you're gonna find it extremely powerful to move your hormone needs over to them. Check them out, Evolve Telemed. Use the link drjade.com slash hormones. drjade.com slash hormones for Evolve Telemed. And let's get back to the show. Now, the one thing that I want to do before I get specifically about some of the questions I have about your book is what what uh, and you give a lot of this stuff in your work. But, you know, you talk about this concept of resistance. You know, it's one of my favorite concepts when I first read about it in The War of Art. Um, What with this concept of resistance, if we're being inspired and if we're taking action, what is this? thing how have you how do you see this why does resistance um begin to try to pull us away and make us procrastinate and distract us and deceive us and you know kind of move us away from what we want to do what is that about is it like a testing ground is it something about our own self doubt what is that that's going on from your perspective and how can we be aware of it and begin to fight against it? uh well this is from this book of mine the war of art Mm-hmm. Um, which talks about resistance with a capital R. And I'll, I'll sort of give you a long version here, Jade. Mm-hmm. Like if we believe in the in the higher level above us and we're here on the material level, in between there's another level and that level is the negative level. That's trying to stop the good stuff from coming down to us and stop us from going up to the good stuff. Why it's there, uh, that's a whole other, other issue. But uh, I can... If you want me to give you my, my real answer, I would. I would love to hear what your thoughts on, are on it. I mean, I, I think that, uh, okay, this is a long version of it, but um, I think we can define our, where the center of our identity is. It's in one of two places, in my mind. It's either in the ego or it's in the self, the capital L, capital S self, in the Jungian sense, the greater, the greater being. Like, I would say the ego is this little tiny dot that's in our that's our our reasoning self, the self that we call I. It's the I that identifies with the material world, with our physical body, with our success, with our family, with our career. Well, that's that's the that's the ego, and it, which is a very narrow, selfish place. And it comes. Its predominant emotion is fear. Fear that we're going to fail, fear that we're going to lose what we have, fear that we're never going to succeed. But there's a greater self that in the Carl Jungian sense, which would include dreams, visions, intuition, the deep unconscious, the deep subconscious, the collective unconscious, all of the wisdom of the human race that has been. And I would say that's this higher level. So. What we're when when we on the lower level, ah, resistance. I believe this negative force of that's trying. Like uh, you articulated it before, where you were saying in my long years that the, a voice must have been saying to me, "You're crazy to keep believing in this. You know, give it up." Da 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 da. That's the voice of resistance. 
And I think what happens is when we try to move from our identity, from the ego, the little selfish, self-interested ego to the self, the higher, higher plane, the ego doesn't want that to happen. Because if we identify with that big thing, it's out of a job. So it will create this barrier in between to try to keep us in the ego, to keep us in this small, small way of thinking. That's why it takes so much guts to go to, the, to, to believe, to trust in the higher level, because our ego is, wants to stay in control and is going to work against us all the time. So I don't know, maybe that's a little too complicated. Well, no, I mean, I, I love that because it's sense, it, it makes complete sense to me, at least in my psychology background, if that's the base level human, the ego is dominating there. If you have fear, then f fear is going to elicit in you the need for power and control. So the ego is going to try to fight for its survival. And it does that by trying to keep you small and away from this sort of greater wisdom because I think you put it really interestingly, because if, if you merge with this greater thing, you realize that it's you're part of it. You're much bigger than just this I and you can do so much more if you trust it. But that's a very scary thing, right? Because most people would say that's, you know, airy fairy. We that's too much woo. That's this and that. But once you begin to believe in it, the ego essentially must necessarily be pushed aside a bit and now all of a sudden you can begin to get this uh you know sort of download from the muse and i'm wondering if you know i, I wonder for you uh the ego seems like it's always going to be there but it seems like somewhere around 55 50 years old when you first were like okay i am going to make this transition just to listening to my heart that that is when you begin to start finally conquering resistance i think that's exactly true and in fact i'm going to recommend another book for for you and our listeners it's by a guy named Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, who is a Franciscan monk or Benedictine monk, but a real down-to-earth guy. And the book is called Fall Upward. Mm. And what he does is just what you said, Jade. He kind of divides life into two halves, the first half and the second half. And around 50, somewhere that's kind of the, 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 the dividing line, somewhere around there. And he says that the first half of life is about the ego. It's about, uh, can I learn a career? Can I find a spouse? Can I have a family? Can I create an identity where I say, okay, you know, I'm a uh, investment banker or I, whatever it is, right? It's about sort of what he would call, say, creating the vessel. And then when you get to that point, when you've sort of done that, you move to the second level and it's sort of like, well, what do I put in this vessel? It's like, I've already done it. Am I going to keep doing this again and again and again? Just in other words, that's the sort of ego half of life. Hmm. And when you get to that second half of life, according to Richard Rohr, which I believe in, you really graduate to the self in a sense. And you start to have a much instead of thinking only about your, your own little self, you start to think about other people, your family, the, the greater community. What can I do for other people? What can I do to teach? What can I do to give? And then your universe kind of expands. And also, if you're thinking about a new business that you're going to do, you will naturally start to think more about what can I do that, that people need? What is it that's out there that I can bring that nobody else can bring? Instead of saying, you know, how can I make some money? Or what can I come up with some concept, you know, where I can go viral and, you know, overnight I'll make a million bucks. So uh, anyway, the book is called Falling Upward by Richard Rohr. And uh, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I love I love that idea. And it does make me think um, of this idea. I certainly went through some tough times. I'm, I'm just getting ready to turn 50 now. But in my 40s, I feel like I began this process where I essentially moved away from this idea of Jade being, hey, look at me. I'm Jade Tita. I've got all these gifts. Pay attention to me. You know, sort of my child adolescent self. And through my own personal failings and having to take a look, a deep look at myself, I went to this place where I'm like, I have two jobs. I got to take care of myself and simultaneously take care of other because I'm not separate from them. And if I hurt someone else, you know, I sort of hurt myself. And that had a profound impact. I, I would call it not a midlife crisis, but a midlife awakening. And it did have a, pri a, a really big impact on 
my creative process because my creative process used to be like, I'm going to you know invent this new way of training or this new way of treating a particular disease. And I'm going to write about it. And I want people to tell me I'm good and have accolades and all this stuff. But then I got to this place where I think um, perhaps similar to you, where I was like, you know what? I know that I'm unique. I know I have a unique voice and unique experiences, and I am going to simply do my job as my purpose, show up, do my job, and legacy in the sense of it used to be legacy was like look at me but now it's more like legacy in the sense of i know that i can make a difference in my actions and no one will ever really know my name and it doesn't matter right because <laughs> all yeah. that matters is that my ripples are help lift people up rather than our waves that crash over them and sink them down and, and i came to this point where i was like i think your pain the primary way that you kind of see yourself is some people will take their pain and pass it on. And I think when you really grow up and get past ego, what you do is you take your pain, you learn from the lessons and it becomes a path to purpose for you where you begin to help others. And I really feel like this is what you've done with a lot of your work, because I'll, I'll tell you something that, you know, you probably hear this a lot, but one of the things about your work in the nonfiction world, because that's mostly uh, where I've read your work, is that there was something about your story that I said, Stephen gets it. He's been through it because you were vulnerable in telling your story and very free in, in telling sort of the pain and the path of pain that you dealt with and also how to turn it around. And that gave gives a ton of credibility because I saw a part of myself in your story, which is really interesting, right? Because we are connected that way. You know, like you yeah. are a part of me. I am a part of you. And so when I see your process reflected in myself and then see you go, Jade, trust the muse. Jade, you know, like make sure that you pay close attention to what's in your heart. Make sure you look out for resistance. It helps me to get to the next level. And it has been a really, really uh, powerful thing for my own journey to then see that I can do that as well. And so then I have someone like you that I learned from, right? And I think then I got, then I can begin to teach out of that, out of my learnings. And then I get to love, which I would say create, you know, so to me, I think there's three reasons we're on the planet to learn, to teach and to love. And that love piece is, I think, the final piece where we create something not out of our ego, but we create something out of this beautiful place above that sort of shines sort of through us out of the muse. And that's where books like, you know, put your ass where your heart wants to be in the war of art and these things come from. And I'll say one more thing. I know I'm talking a lot here, but I think <laughs> what's beautiful about them and what's beautiful about you, Stephen, is that this by trusting this muse, you have put things out into the world that those ripples have deeply impacted people like me that you've never even met before. Not just me, but millions of us. And in a sense, right, like the ego would say, oh, I want to do that. But you didn't get there by listening to the ego. You got there simply by tapping into the creative universal consciousness, translating it for us and bringing something that we could all relate to and learn from. Let me ask you something, Jade, when you were just talking about in your 40s that you started to have a you felt like you were on a, a different path here. Was mm -hmm. there a particular moment for you or a, a crisis or anything where you you felt like you turned some kind of a corner? Yeah, no question about it. I, I was having an affair at the time, uh, being completely, uh, you know, dis dishonest and disloyal to my my wife. What was really interesting is the woman I was having an affair with, she was also married. This is a really, most people who listen to this podcast know this story, but it was a beautiful, the most beautiful moment in time for me because I was caught in this betrayal sandwich. I was having an affair <laughs> with this other woman who was having an affair and I caught her having a third affair. <laughs> I was the one that caught us. So I was in this betrayal sandwich. And, and the reason it woke me up was because I saw immediately the pain that I was under, that I was causing and that I was trapped. I could see it simultaneously because I was in this betrayal sandwich and uh -huh. it woke me up out of what are you doing uh, on this planet? It made me ask this question. Why are you here and what do you want to be? You know, how do you want to show up? And it very clearly uh, helped me see that my actions were all coming from a place of fear, of lack of worthiness, this uh, this idea of ego keeping me down, wanting attention, wanting accolades kind of broke me down to my base level. And then I was just like, listen, I just want my life to be about 
serving other human beings. I want to create for others and make a difference for others. And everything began to change for me at that point. And I think uh, not in terms of accolades, just in terms of my sense of pride and fulfillment. And so whether I get anyone paying attention to my work or not now, Stephen, and I wonder if you feel the same way, I feel like I'm in alignment with the universal consciousness that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, did you at that moment, Jay, did you have a moment where you sort of said to yourself, uh, okay, this is my, what my new life is going to be like, almost like a moment where you write a list or you say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, and I'm not going to do this. Did you do anything like that? Or was, did it take some other form? It, you know what it was like? It, it was this immediate realization that um, I had always been being prepared for the work that I was getting ready to do. In other words, I had always been uh, fascinated with psychology and philosophy and health and healing, but I had focused on fitness and health and healing and for a long time put the psychology and philosophy stuff away. And I realized that all of a sudden in an instant with this thing that happened, and when I say in an instant, it really happened over the period of about 18 months of this very difficult period of time. But what I realized is that, oh, this is really interesting. The world seems to very much want me to pick back up the mantle of self-development, psychology, philosophy, my counseling background. It wants me to go in this direction. And I have a very deep experiential uh, sort of feeling of how to do this now. And it, and it came out of that work, which is why, um, like you and I talked about now, the next level human concept is a concept that that's the self-development work that I do. Not a lot of people know that work uh, from me. They mostly see me as a health and fitness guy, uh -huh. but it really came out of this idea of my pain pointing me back to my unique nature that was always there and always pushing me in this direction. And it was just a matter of me listening to, I guess, what you would call the muse. I just started listening and, and uh, reluctantly at first, because I was like, I don't know that I want to go in this direction. It's uncomfortable, but I couldn't help it. Uh -huh. Did you have any kind of a therapist or anybody that was in a mentor role to you there? You did it all by yourself, huh? Yeah, I did. Well, you know, um, I'll tell you, uh, the Stoic philosophers, you know, uh, Marcus uh -huh. Aurelius, Seneca, you know, Taoism, I read, you know, so my mentors were you and other uh -huh. authors and people from the past. They were people who I was reading in books and seeing that they had gone through the same things. And that's why I think the creative potential is so powerful, because when we create, I think, from where you're talking about this world, you know, up here, the universe yeah. and the muse, when we create from that place, it touches a lot, a lot of people in the process. Huh. And so that was something that I, I also have deep uh, experience uh, with. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share one other thing that's really interesting about this is that um, I, I, I excitingly, when you and I hooked up on social media, I excitingly told my parents because they know I'm a huge fan of yours and have read all your works and tell everyone to read your stuff. And one of the things that uh, I'll, I'll share with you and the listeners, and, and many people know me, uh, probably know this, that I've always said, I want a career. If if I was going to be a writer, I'd want a career like yours. Because to me, you're like the Bo Jackson of the writing world. You basically <laughs> are like, and for those of you who don't know the, the, the reference of Bo Jackson, you know, he played football and baseball at a very high level. So to me, a person who can write nonfiction and fiction and have, you know, people just love their work, whether they're nonfiction or fiction, I was like, I want that, that world uh, I want to be writing in the health and fitness world and the self-development world as Stephen Pressfield writes in the fiction and nonfiction uh -huh. world. And so uh -huh. it's really a, an interesting, fun thing for me to be able to talk to you about your work and your influence, because it's a, it's somebody who you are always been someone who I have considered a mentor and a sort uh -huh. of because of the, the, the way that you have done that. So when you ask, were there mentors? Kid you not, you know, uh -huh. you were one, you know, and uh -huh. I do think people should realize that, um, you know, mentors don't always come in the form of, uh, you know, sort of personal friends. Like now we get to sit and talk one on one, but your book spoke to me and raised me up, you know, from mm. that respect. Ah. Let me throw another one at, for our listeners here on the subject of mentors. Mm -hmm. For me, one of my greatest mentors has been dreams. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in dreams that and that we have you know right inside us in that deep self the unconscious whatever it is a source of wisdom that is always trying to guide us you know and uh, i'm a big believer in recording your dreams and trying to analyze them and they have definitely 
at, at points in my life have really, uh, you know, steered me the right way. Or when I was in, in terrible doubt, a dream has said to me, you know, hold steady. You're on the right track, you know, and it wasn't another human being. It wasn't a book or anything like that, but it was, it was even better because it was coming out of me. Um, so I highly recommend listening to your dreams. Yeah. It's almost like that's your direct access. It sounds like you would say something, yeah. that's your direct access into sort of this realm uh, that uh, can speak to you. Did you ever, uh, I'm wondering, did any of your books ever come to you in dreams, your ideas? Because I know you said they just hit you out of the blue at times. Did, were they were they dream oriented or did they come to you? You know, like sometimes ideas come to you in the shower or when you're driving, when you're sort of more in your subconscious brain. I'm wondering if, if any of your books came to you in those situations. No, nothing's ever come to me in a dream, but... Uh, other things have just come to me where I knew they were a book. Hmm. Like um, I, have, I wrote a book about Alexander the Great called uh, The Virtues of War. Hmm. And the way this thing came to me was I got the first two sentences. They just, and the first two sentences were, I have always been a soldier. I have known no other life. And when I, that sort of came to me, I thought that's the first two sentences of a book. But I didn't know for months, I was asking myself, who's saying this? Who is, whose voice is that? And I kind of tried on all different, is it so-and-so, is it so-and-so, is it so-and-so? And, uh, and, and finally, after like three or four months, I realized, ah, this is a book about Alexander the Great. Why I said that, I have no idea, you know? But that, so that's, that's the one case of something that just absolutely popped into me like a lyric in a song. And and was absolutely on target. Oh, I love that. And, and you know, we're, we're coming up on time and I want to be I want to be uh, respectful of your time. But I do want to talk about this this uh, latest work. And and here's a here's sort of one of the ways I want to just briefly get into this. So I've heard people say because, you know, um, many of my friends, we all were like, oh, Stephen's got a new book coming out. So, you know, we we pass it around and we've all read it. And so a few people are just like. How come some people out on the Internet are saying, oh, this is like all his other work just in a new book. Right. And for me, I don't see it that way at all. And I want to see how you answer that potential thing that some people are saying, because I've heard people say, if you've read Stephen Pressfield, you've re actually read this book before. I actually don't see that at all. But I want to let I have my answer for that. But I want to see what you have to say about that in terms of. What makes this a different Stephen Pressfield book? What makes it, from your perspective, something that had to be put out that is different from every other thing um, that you've done? Well, it, it, it's that's right that it is like uh, everything else that I've done. It's mm. definitely in the same vein, mm. but I don't see anything wrong with that. Mm. I think it's like going to the gym. You know, you can be told the same thing again and again, and it works. Mm. You know, you need that. But I do think that this way of looking at it, the concept of put your ass where your heart wants to be, is a different way of saying things that I've said before. Mm. One, it would be beat resistance. One would be turn pro. That was my mm. second book in this turn pro. Book, by the way. And, uh, and a third one in there, do the work, mm. is, is another book that I've written. It's saying the exact same thing. Put your ass where your heart wants to be equals do the work equals turn pro, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But it's a but it's a way it's a different way of looking at it, you know, of putting your putting your commitment into a place and then the good things that come out of that. But it, but the people who say that they're right. Mm. I mean, I talk about the muse. I talk about resistance. I talk about all the things I always talk about. Mm. Um but hopefully from a little different angle. Yeah. And, and let me tell you how, I, how I've answered this as well, because I've kind of yeah, said what's your thing. answer? Well, yeah, I basically said, yes. I mean, of course, like his work is imbued in here and you can see aspects of all his work. But if you take all your nonfiction work and put it together in a very concise form with deep wisdom, like it takes you, you cut in, you put three sentences together in this particular book that literally cover like, you know, hundreds of words in your past books. It's almost like it's so succinct, so powerful that it's it's sort of like when I'm reading this book, it's like, first of all, I'm reading a book from start to finish, but I'm also sort of reading like one of these books that's like a daily 
you know, sort of meditation where I literally can open it up to this short little passage and get such tremendous sort of value. So the way I saw it was like, this is the evolution of a, a simplified sort of version of all these books taking the most powerful points of wisdom out of them. And it, one of the things I said is I said, you know, it's funny, you know, I've recommended your books to a ton of people, but if I had to recommend just one now, it would be this particular book. If someone said, what's the Stephen Pressfield book that I should read? I would say, put your ass where your heart wants to be is the one that covers all his work in the most succinct way and gets all his wisdom down in these powerful, pertinent points that, you know, you just can't get in another book. And it's a quick read, too. I mean, it's one of these things that I think speaks to where we are in the current uh, sort of uh, culture as well. Yeah, books are getting quicker and quicker. I remember when when uh, when the War of Art came out, it was like 20 years ago. And I thought, well, this is really a short book. I mean, look how short it is. You know, now you look at it, it looks like War and Peace. You know, like, uh, <laughs> You know, nobody would ever sit through 160 something pages. Like that. <laughs> but yeah, but I do think as as you sort of are developing a philosophy, and I know you know just exactly what this is, Jane. Mm. You get to say it in fewer and fewer words because mm. you know it more. You know, yeah. it's you're honing it down more. The message, anyway. So my final question for you, Stephen, is um, for the individuals who um, are. Uh, you know, sort of in this place where they want to and they're feeling like, you know, I understand what it's like when Stephen was in his 20s and his 30s and his 40s, you know, kind of banging his head against the wall, feeling this pull, you know, from his heart, but, you know, needing to make ends meeting, all that kind of stuff. What would be sort of the final things that you would say to those who are struggling in that regard that uh, maybe we haven't you know, sort of covered yet. What what would you leave them with to kind of say, hey, look, it took me to 55 and look at my career. You know, here's what you need to be thinking about. Yeah, I would I would say, you know, uh, to take to be patient, mm -hmm. to take some pressure, the self-imposed pressure off, because uh, we all feel like I know when I was 30, I felt I was like, uh, you know, one foot from the grave. I, you know, I'd uh, well, my God, I'm 30 years old, you know, and, and uh, but life is long. And we, it takes time to evolve sometimes. Um, on the other hand, when you really feel like you're really pregnant and that baby's inside you and you can feel it growing, don't be afraid to give birth, mm. you know. And, uh, you know, there is a time when you do have to, to jump off the cliff. Mm. But, um, but, and you'll know it when the time comes. Mm. But I, I think we're all impatient because we want to get there. You know, we want to feel that, but sometimes it just takes a while. You you're on a road. It's not quite the road, you know, but it's, 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 it's parallel to the road. And then you get a little bit closer to the road and then finally you get to the actual road that you want to be on. Mm. But uh, don't be too down on yourself when you're over here, because you'll get here and then you'll get here. Life is long and, and uh, we're all going to get there. Yeah. It's basically sounds like you're saying trust the work, you know, um, trust the muse, do the work, be patient. And when you feel it, you got to take the shot and, you know, be brave enough to do it. And you certainly have done that. Yeah. Uh, in and your this career. book I recommended earlier, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he his word for the muse, for that higher dimension, he calls it source, the capital S. Mm -hmm. And he says, like, uh, if you're a hip hop group, Source is broadcasting constantly, kind of like the radio waves. You know, in his view, Rick Rubin's view, it's not a rare little jewel that you're looking for. It's like the trade winds mm. that are blowing constantly, you know. And all you really need, all we need to do is trust it and tune into it. It's like I think everybody is getting ideas all the time. But a lot of us, through resistance, dismiss them. We say, oh, that's been done before, or I could never do that, or I'm not ready to do that. But the ideas are there, that that other dimension is constantly broadcasting. Mm. And uh, if we can tune into that, that's the real secret. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I love that uh, he calls it source in my in my latest book, The Next Level Human. Uh, I also call it source. Uh, mainly, oh, really? Maybe he's a reader of Spinoza. I, I, yeah, I, I, I yeah, yeah. Pick that up from Spinoza. Either he's but, uh, ripping you off, or you're ripping him off. No, not you. Well, you, the, the reason I brought it up is because it's such a beautiful thing, right? One of the things I've seen in the creative space is that uh, you know these ideas of ideas that come to us sometimes yeah. the, it's really They're out there, isn't it? How life all of a sudden you got four or five different people in the world getting the same idea. It's almost like yeah. the universe wants this birthed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a really beautiful thing. Yeah. Thank you so much, my friend. Seriously, I, I, I appreciate your generosity. We appreciate all of us. I, I think I'm speaking for all of us who love your work. Thank you for what you have put out. Thank you for trusting the muse. Thank you for, for putting your ass in the seat and, and doing the work <laughs> over the long run. And that now we have your work to benefit from. Well, thanks for having me, Jade. It's great that we finally met each other, at least via, you know, uh, podcasting. Yeah, and, uh, for sure. I'm happy to uh, do this again anytime you want, you know, and I hope we get to meet each other in person one of these days. Yeah, I would love that. Let's real quick tell everybody where they can, where are you hanging out now? I know I'm seeing you on YouTube. I know I'm seeing you on Instagram. So where can everyone uh, find you? And I did notice that you put your book out. Uh, the latest book is in, it's in ebook. It's in, um, on Audible. And it's in paperback as well. So you guys definitely go and get this book. But where can they find more of Stephen Pressfield and uh, sort of your musings and what you're doing online and all that? Yeah, just kind of like where everybody else is. I'm on Instagram and I have a website that's just my name, you know, StephenPressfield.com. And the book is everywhere. And so are all my other books. You can't get away from me. Thank you so much, my friend. Just loved having you here. All right. Thanks a lot, Jade. We'll do it again sometime.